Paul the First Antichrist. Okay, so this video is going to uh, discuss the many proofs that Paul taught an opposing message and his fact. In fact, the first Antichrist, and remember, Antichrist just means against Christ or against Christ's teachings. So, what we're going to address, uh, we're going to address in this order, is we're going to address the requirements to of Christ's message to be Christ's message that was given us uh, in, in, in the, the, this, the basic videos that I put out, one, two, and three, it's in the second video. So go back and watch that. Go watch all three of them if you haven't seen it. That's everything is in there except the specifics on Paul. So, okay, so the requirements to be Christ's message. Second, we're going to talk about the message of Paul versus the message of Christ, because really uh, it is entirely the message uh, that's important, and Christ said that. Um, and then Jesus' prophecy about Paul, um, uh, literally he prophesies about Paul and the first Antichrist, or Antichrist in general, okay? <clears throat> so going back, the re go going back to what I've covered in the, in, the, in the videos in the past, which you should see if you haven't spent time, the requirements for Christ's message uh, slash gospel. Okay, the key points are, it must be the original message, Okay, once again, this is a rehash, so that's in 1 John 1, 1 through 4, 1 John 5, 2 through uh, 5, 2, 2 John 1, 10, 1 John 2, 22 through 25. What this means is the original message is the message that was conveyed to the apostles and the people that walked with Christ the whole time he was in his ministry. And it literally says in there, walked with him, talked with him, touched him, heard him face to face, and they use the word touch in there as well. Okay, so if someone is, so first we need to know that message, okay, which I've given you in the third video, <clears throat> if you go back and watch it, uh, the third basics video, um, and uh, um, it made, it made it clear that, that to actually physically touch was one of the requirements to be in a, to be for the whatever the message is I can't can't deviate from that message okay that was given by Christ and those who followed which were the apostles and Paul is not an apostle never was <clears throat> we'll go into that no new teachings um, so the original message can only it cannot vary from what was when Christ talked and the people around him that physically touched him there's no new teachings beyond what Christ talked about. So if anyone comes along and teaches you something that Christ didn't, um, then, you know, beware. Um, the apostles' truth was original. Once again, going back to the original message with Christ. I'll give you the verses. No new teachings. 1 John 2, 7. Apostles' truth was original. 1 John 5, 20 through 21. John 10, 1. John 10, 9. Okay. Uh, the, the gospel, the message is about... Um, or the gospel is about the message, not the man. John six sixty three means that if all they're talking to you about is where he was born, where he died, da, 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 all those things, that is not the message, and that is not one of the teachings. Christ never talked about it. It's about the message he taught while he was here. Okay, um, no original sin. Um, this is given in John one nine, um, stating that uh, as everyone enters this world. Uh, the light enters in them, a piece of divinity, Christ enters into them, that's Christ in you, okay? Um, <clears throat> Ecclesiastes 7.29, God has made man upright, Genesis 1.26.31, made in God's image, James 3.9, James 1.13-15. Uh, there's a conflicting message being preached while John is alive. John is giving these requirements for the gospel, by the way, it's in John, you've heard the verses. Um, and at the time John is alive, there's a conflicting message being preached, meaning opposite of what Christ taught. John's bringing it to the forefront. He gives us these requirements for a message to be of Christ. And the, and the conflicting message being preached, he talks about in 1 John 2.19. Um, the way, his teachings, 1 John 2, 3 through 4. Many other things Christ taught. Uh, there's a verse in there, I guess I didn't put it next to that. <clears throat> the Antichrist is here now. 1 John 2.18, meaning now, meaning um, when John was writing this, which he was once again, uh, got to go back and watch the videos, he was the last apostle alive 
everybody was deceased, passed away um, by, uh, by, you know, at least 10 to 30 years, depending on what scholar you go by. Um, uh, Jerusalem in 70 AD was totally destroyed. Uh, remember, if you go back to those videos, it was totally destroyed, literally taken down piece by piece, plowed under. All the writings were destroyed. Um, many believe, including I, that, that it was done, that was done so because um, the message that Christ was teaching was gaining force and it was not uh, uh, as what the Romans needed to keep order. Um, it, it, uh, so therefore, they destroyed everything because if you go back and listen to what I said in the other videos, it was not their common practice to, to destroy buildings. They would just repurpose them. Um, why waste good stuff? They would repurpose them, use them, dedicate to their gods, whatever, however it went. Okay. Um, so, once again, for emphasis, the doctrine John preaches was given to the, the apostles directly from Christ face to face during his time. It's legitimate, true, the original gospel. Any teaching that comes from any other source is not reliable, and we're encouraged to guard ourselves against it, not not kind of not out of legalistic righteousness, but making sure we follow the right path. So anything else is a bad roadmap and will lead us to somewhere other than where Christ would like us to go, where we want to go. Um, so once again, about the message, not the man. And I've, I've given you the verses. I'm not going to read them here because you should, you can, you can pull them down and read them yourself, or better yet, go watch the the first three videos that I gave you. They're, it's good stuff. Um, Apostles' gospel was was original. There's the, the the words on that. Once again, this is. This is just part of it. Okay, so here, here, are, here are the concerns about Paul. The most concerning issue with Paul is his gospel is totally opposite of what Christ taught. Um, and, and, of course, may, I have many other proofs beyond this. But this is the most important thing. I mean, if you're going to go against what Christ taught, the definition of a Christian is following Christ's teachings. So if you don't follow his teachings, are you really a Christian? If you're sitting in, in a church... Uh, that isn't following what Christ taught and is following what some other mere man taught, uh, you need to start guarding yourself and looking for the truth. Um, and we'll get into that. Or I have gotten into that in those other videos. So, Paul's teachings and what you're going to hear in most churches. Jesus, Jesus died to take away, take on, take away your sins. Christ never said that. Uh, God never said that. It's, it's against what God said. Original sin. Nowhere to be found in what Christ and or God said in the Old Testament. All you have to do is believe in Jesus. Jesus never said that. Being saved is a principle. And Jesus, not even consistent with what Christ or God said. Once saved, always saved. Um, save, being saved is a process um, because you can turn away from God and, and, and really you're just saved forever. No, that's, it, it makes no sense. Um, you can, so the, the church preaches you can't do it yourself, and therefore, in parentheses, we have the only Savior in town. Uh, and by the way, I need your, your 10% ties. Oh, 10% minimum, and then, of course, we've got to build on to the church. We've got to do this, we've got to do that, and we've got to bring on this and that. Um, I don't, I'm not going to break bad on the church. Churches do a lot of good things. I was in them forever, and I wish I could be in another, but they just don't teach the true teachings. Therefore, that would be that would be against God. Um, someone else can do it for you, can save you. Not a not a Christ principle, and definitely not a God principle. Um, so all these things um, <clears throat> allow us to lower expectations of ourselves and others. Think about it. Original sin, oh, lowly sinner. Now we're going to get. I went into all that. Okay, I'm not going to get into it. So what is Christ's gospel? These are the key elements mentioned by Christ. We all have divinity in us from inception. That was John 1, 9. The kingdom is within us. A whole series of verses. It is not about the man. It's about the message. John 6, 63. Keep the commandments all over the place. Christ is all, all over the place on that. A great and new commandment. Love your neighbor as yourself. Uh, so on and so forth. That actually isn't a new commandment. It's, it's, it's uh, in the Old Testament. And I covered it in another, the other video. Um, and sacrifice, um, Christ came to bring on uh, baptism for, re re for remission of sins um, and got away from the sacrificial system. Um, 
and uh, that's why he that was that was one of his big purposes. None of the parables he uses use sacrifice as a means of forgiveness. There's one true God, slash Father. Um, uh, Christ showed us God's true character, and we are we are to connect directly with God. And Christ tells us how once again covered before. Um, the Father, we are as children in the process of growth. The worst thing you can do for your children is to do everything for them. Um, and we're going to go on from there. So Christ is, is proclaiming the good news that God has not forgotten his people. Um, um, so every description in, in Jesus' message and purpose, both in the Old and New Testament, points to salvation consisting of regeneration coming from repentance and uh, the goal of, of a people to eager to do God's will. Okay, so now we're going to get into, that's the overview of the message. Now, Jesus, did, did Jesus, or I'm going to tell you Jesus, prophesied directly about Paul, okay? And not just about some Antichrist, but literally about Paul. And we're going to go through those. Um, the nature of Christ's return expected prior to Paul's experience. This is the first thing. So in Acts 1, 9 through 11. The resurrected Jesus was taken up into the sky while the apostles were watching. An angel clearly explained to the twelve, just as you saw him go, he will return. Um, so he had a physical departure, so the angel promised a physical return. Jesus spoke of this return. They shall see the Son of Man coming in the clouds of heaven with power and great glory. That's Matthew twenty four thirty. John refers to the same event as every eye will see him. Uh, John wrote a vision of Christ returning from heaven. Uh, look, he is coming with the clouds, and every eye will see him, even those <clears throat> who pierced him and all the peoples of the earth who mourn because of him. Revelation 1, 7. So, um, so when when Paul supposedly, so if Jesus prophes if th this is this is how it's going to be uh, when he comes back. Everybody's going to know. There's going to be no doubt. There's not going to be any question marks. Everybody's going to know. And then, supposedly, he appears to Paul and uh, contradicts all these verses and what, what Christ said after the resurrection and before the ascension. Okay, So either, either Christ and all these apostles are lying or Paul has been deceived slash lying. Okay? So Jesus' warning in Matthew 24, 4 and 5. And Jesus answered and said to them, Take heed that no man deceive you, for many shall come in my name, saying, I am Christ, and, and sh shall deceive many. Okay, key there. Um, Jesus identified the misleader. The misleader says that he's going he's gonna to say he is the Christ. He is he. He's coming in Jesus' name. So the misleader, Paul did see the misleader who said he was Christ. Okay, And where would he be especially on guard for this misleader, uh, for the false Christ to appear? Uh, one in Jerusalem, two a mountaintop, three a wilderness or a desert. Um, not Jesus. It's not going to be Jesus if it's in the wilderness. Matthew 24, 24 through 27. What is wilderness? Um, wilderness is described in 2 Corinthians eleven twenty six. 26. Uh, wilderness is also described in 1 Kings nineteen fifteen. And the Lord said unto him, Go, return on thy way to the wilderness of Damascus, and when thou comest, anoint Hazel to be king over Syria. Okay, that was... Uh, that was um, in the Old Testament, um, and that's really one of the other places where it's made very clear. Um, supernatural voices discussed in Acts 9, 3 through 5. If I read all these, we'd never get through it, so I'm just giving you the verses. You, you need to look them up yourself. If you're watching this, you're somebody who wants depth anyway, because uh, it's not a superficial message whatsoever. Um, so the super vo supernatural voice said, I am Jesus, I am he, I am the Messiah, I am Christ. Jesus said the false Messiah would, would say those things and don't follow that voice if it's in the wilderness. So once again, um, he told us how he would return in Matthew 24, 24 through 27. So here's what he says. For false Christs and false prophets will rise and perform great sign and wonders so as to lead you astray, if possible, even the elect. Um, see, I have told you beforehand so if, if they say to you, lo, or look, he is in the wilderness, do not go out. If they say, look, he is in inner rooms, do not believe it. For as lightning comes from the east and shines as, as far as the west, 
So will be the coming of the Son of Man. Whenever, wherever the corpse is near, then vultures will gather. Okay, Revelation one seven. Behold, he is coming with the clouds, and every eye will see him, even those who pierced him, and all the tribes of the earth will mourn because of him. Even so, Amen. So that was not that that was not met. So that okay. So here we go. We're gonna we're gonna buzz through this. It's a lot. How to identify the misleader, saying, I am Christ, I am he. That's Matthew 24, 4 through 5, Luke 21, 6, Acts 9, 5. In the wilderness, Matthew 24, 26. As near Damascus, Acts 9, 4. Not every eye will see me, um, which contradicts Matthew 24, 27. Uh, men with Saul didn't see anyone, Acts 9, 7. Paul, or was Paul already protected from any error? So had Paul converted just before or as as this as he saw the person the, the thing he saw the false Christ, is there evidence the Holy Spirit protected Paul from error? No, he came straight from from the killing fields, so no, uh, there was no protection from error. Um, this is what we know about Paul when he meets the voice, the light. Paul is still an unrepentant murderer, admitting he was uh, in the party that murdered Stephen. Acts twenty two three through twenty one. Paul is still a Pharisee. I'm a Pharisee, Acts 23, 6. This is Paul. This Paul was lost, not even on good ground, as Jesus, Jesus identified in the sower parable. So did anything change? Um, there is never a record of Paul repenting to, to Jesus at the scene or later, nor is there any evidence Paul believed in Jesus as the Messiah, Son of God, during the vision encounter. So with darkened spiritual understanding, how did Paul know who the voice voice and light was. Paul himself will explain the devil goes about as an angel of light. 2 Corinthians 11, 14. So one more proof, the false message. Luke 21, 8. If they preach the time is near, is near do not follow them. Romans 3, 12. The day is near. The one who Paul listened to gave th that message. Okay, uh, Did Paul properly vest the vet or test the voice. No test. Just believed it was Jesus. Binding is something Satan would do. Okay? And that was... We'll go back to that. Jesus warns, do not listen to them. Luke 21, 8. Who was the light and the voice? So the companions did not see anyone. Paul could see nothing. Acts 9, 7 through 8. Um, this being presented, itse presented itself was a light brighter than the sun. Acts 26, 13. Lucifer's description is Isaiah 14, 12. Hillel, the original Hebrew word translated as Lucifer in Isaiah 14, 12. Hillel comes from the verbal root that means to shine brightly. Uh, Strong's 1984. Um, his name matched his character. Sun God, blinding, blinded by the light, brighter or clear God. Attributes of Satan. 2 Corinthians eleven fourteen. Masquerades as the angel of light. Matthew 13, 19, 25, 38, 39. Binds the, men's of, the minds of men to the gospel. 2 Corinthians 4, 3 and 4 induces them to accept this lie. 2 Thessalonians 2, 9 through 10. Transforms himself to the angel of light. Uh, 2 Corinthians 11, 13 through 15. Presenting his apostles of falsehood as messengers of truth. So if someone teaches the good news to someone else, do they owe that person their soul? Another topic. Uh, Philemon 1.9. Um, Paul makes this statement that Philemon owes him his, his soul. So um, I, Paul, have written with my hand, I myself will pay without saying to you also that you owe me your soul. Okay, so um, Paul is the only one to call himself an apostle. John 5.31. If I bear witness of myself, my witness is not true. There, there is another that beareth witness of me, and I know that witness which is witness of me is true. So Paul is called an apostle around 177 times. Um, every time except one, it is, call, it is only Paul that calls himself an apostle. That's in Revelation 2. Okay, so in Revelation 2, to the, to the angel of the church of Ephesus, um, these are words of him who holds true the seven stars in his right hand and walks among the seven gold, golden lampstands. I know your deeds, your hard work, your perseverance. I know that you cannot tolerate wicked people, that you have tested those who, who claim to be apostles but are not 
and have found them false. You have persevered and have endured hardships for my name and have not grown weary. weary. So Jesus in Revelation uh, has another statement, obviously intended to alert discerning Christians that Jesus refers negatively to Paul's teachings. In Revelation chapter 2, Jesus compliments the Ephesians for determining someone who said he was an apostle was in fact not truthful about being an apostle. The Ephesians are also commented by Jesus for recognizing not to listen to the one who says it's okay to eat meat sacrificed to idols. Paul both taught that it was okay to eat meat sacrificed to idols. Um, that you refrain only, Paul said that you refrain only around weaker brother who thinks it is wrong. And Paul taught that the Ephesians that he was an apostle of Jesus. All right, Peter versus Paul. This is one that. Uh, <clears throat> this is basically the, the main thing that a, a pastor said to me. What about Peter um, vouching for Paul? Um, well, that just didn't happen, and we're going to go over that. Okay? So Paul in, has called Peter a hypocrite. Okay? Maybe not prior. Somewhere he calls him a hypocrite. Okay? And he declares he doesn't hold the apostles in high esteem. Okay? So Paul boasted in Galatians 2.6, um, that the Twelve taught him nothing over the last 17 years since the Damascus Road experiments. Paul boasted in that period that he had very little interchange with the Apostles, mentioning there was only one brief visit with Peter and James in a two-week uh, period three years after the event outside Damascus. Uh, Peter did not exalt Paul. So, <clears throat> the prophecy concerning Peter. In the last chapter of John's Gospel, Christ made a prophecy concerning Peter, which is, uh, 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 what, what Jesus said is, Most assuredly I say to you, when you were younger, you bound yourself and you walked where you wished. But when you are old, you will stretch forth your hands and another will bind you and take you where you do not wish. John twenty one eighteen. So how did Paul bind Peter to take him where he did not want to go? And he continues to do it today. So it's the same way Christ's prophecy concerning John is fulfilled every time I read the Gospel of John, okay? So, every time someone quotes Peter's words from Second Peter 3, 15 and 16, claiming that Peter called Paul's writing Holy Scripture, they are fulfilling Christ's prophecy concerning Peter. For it is they who are helping Paul bind Peter and are taking Peter's, Peter his testimony where neither he nor Christ wanted him to go, which is in support of Paul against the law, okay? So... I have Romans 16, 24 through 25 here. Um, I didn't put anything under it, so we're going to buzz by it. Um, Paul's gospel is not from Scripture. It's not from man. He said it was from Jesus himself or the Jesus he saw. And list the preaching, uh, the preaching of Jesus after his teaching. Okay, so in three places, the Apostle Paul refers to the message committed to him as my gospel. Romans 2, 16, 16, 25, 2 Timothy 2, 8. Why does Paul personalize the gospel in this way? Um, in 1 Corinthians 4, 14 through 16, followers of me, referencing Paul. 1 Corinthians 4, 15, Paul said, I am your father. Matthew 23, 20, uh, 23, 9, Jesus said, do not call anyone your father. Paul says, don't take people to secular court. Paul, of course, tried to was tried under Caesar's court and requested that. Paul refused to let Mark travel with him, unforgiving and, and unloving, which if you go back to John, my, my basics, first three videos, I talk about um, how that was part of the message of John. Someone was unloving, okay? Um, Galatians 2, 6 through 14 is not true. Peter was to preach to the Gentiles. He calls Peter a hypocrite. Paul is the only witness. You cannot... Christ says you cannot trust when only there's only one witness. Um, 1 Corinthians 1.10, Paul has an issue with people who follow only Christ. Once again, only Paul, one witness. Paul says we are not under the law. Women are under the law. Paul says it's okay to eat food sacrificed. Peter calls Paul brother, not an apostle. Key, very key here. So Peter could not have used the word scriptures uh, we're going back to the binding, okay? Uh, Paul binding Peter. Um, there has never been anywhere in the Bible where a living person wrote scriptures. This only happens after death. Um, and in Second Peter three fifteen and 16, as they 
as they do also the rest of the scriptures. Okay, so Peter did not endorse Paul. Second Peter three fifteen through sixteen. Second Peter three fourteen. Wherefore, beloved, uh, seeing that ye look for such things, be diligent that ye may be found him in peace without spot and blameless. All right, and so here here's where fourteen didn't matter. Fifteen and account that the long suffering of our Lord is salvation. Now I've highlighted these next words because they, I believe, were added. Uh, many believe they were added. Okay, so I'm going to start at fifteen all over again. And account that the long suffering of our Lord is salvation. And then it says, which is highlighted, even as our beloved Paul also, according to the wisdom given to him, hath written unto you, as also in all his epistles, speaking of them in these things, in which some things are hard to be understood, which they that unlearned and unstable rest, as they do also other scriptures on their own destruction. So now we're coming off the highlighting and we're going to, that's 16, we're going to 17. Ye therefore, beloved, seeing ye know these things, beware, lest ye be also being led away with error and wicked, fall from your own steadfastness. Okay, so <clears throat> four reasons, four points showing that um, verses, the, the one and a half verses were added by a scribe later, not written by Peter, okay? So it flows without, men, without the Paul part. I'll read 15 and go to, and drop into 17. Remember, these weren't numbered as verses. This is, these were letters. Um, and account that the long suffering of our Lord is salvation. Ye therefore, beloved, seeing ye know these things before, beware, lest ye be also be led away with error of the wicked, fall from your own steadfastness. Fastness. So that's how it sounds without those one and a half verses in there that many believe were added by a later scribe uh, so that Paul could use Peter or they could use Peter as as a, as a, as a, as a, a authority type thing. So it flows without mentioning Paul. Peter calls him brother. He doesn't give him authority. Okay, if he, if he was an apostle, he would call him an apostle. Hard to understand, question mark. God is not a God of confusion. God would not have inspired confusion. So the fact that he mentions hard to understand, um, and it will, will, doesn't make any sense. Scripture, once again, to say that, for Peter to say that Paul wrote Scripture is absolutely absurd. No scholar would ever say that's possible. No one has ever had their writings declared Scripture before they've passed away. Never. No council ever uh, was ever held to consider Scripture. <clears throat> Paul never wrote about the patience of the Lord so, um, so that more people could be saved. It's not in his letters. He writes the opposite. Peter says be patient. Paul's theme is just around the corner. Peter and Paul write just the opposite about the coming of the Lord. So that whole piece makes no sense. Okay, now we're going to move on to Christ talking about the least. So in Matthew 5, 17 through 19, um, in the, he's referencing a, Jesus is referencing a person he calls the least um, in eth, Ethnos in Greece. So Paul is a Roman name, and in Latin it's a contract, it's, it's Polixus. It means the least. Um, this is this is like jo, Joseph Joe. Okay, um, so Paul even plays on the meaning in Corinthians when Paul says he is the least. Okay, First Corinthians fifteen nine. What, what Christ said in Matthew 5, 17 through 19 also tells us to listen to those who teach the law and they will be called great <coughs> in the kingdom of heaven. But warns us not to listen to the man who teaches you not to follow the law. Jesus said this man will be called the least by those in the kingdom of heaven, which is the shortened name of Paul in Latin, um, which means least. Okay. So next, Jesus Christ, Christ in verse 520 intends us to understand that the least man and his followers are excluded from heaven, absent repentance from such lawless teaching. Okay, second, Jesus warns that after his ascension, many will come in his name, saying they're Jesus in the wilderness, in private places, and say they are him, Christ, or Jesus. Jesus says not to listen to them, for they are imposters. Jesus says you will know it's truly himself only if he's seen from east to west and on Every eye will see him. That's once again repeat Matthew 24, 5 through 8, uh, 24 through 27. 
So Paul's experience outside Damascus exactly matches the imposter Jesus of which Jesus warned. So does Constantine's experience with Jesus. So did Joseph Smith's experience with Jesus. Okay, if you're going to believe Paul, you might as well believe Joseph Smith. Okay, um, biblical meaning of wilderness. So Satan was known to occupy the wilderness areas. This is why Jesus himself went to the wilderness so he could be tested by Satan. Then Jesus was led by the Spirit into the wilderness to be tested by the devil. Matthew four one. Jesus identifies in verse ten that his encounter was with Satan himself. The word wilderness is used in the Bible means an area outside a city. Paul used it in 2 Corinthians 11.26. The term may be understood not strictly of desert places, but of the country in distinction from the city. Next, um, besides outside Damascus as being equivalent to wilderness, there is one time in the Bible the very same area is described as wilderness. It's Kings, 1 Kings 19.15. I talked to you about that. Elijah was told to take the wilderness road to Damascus. In, once again, in Kings, 1 Kings 19.15, God speaks to Elijah while Elijah is at Horeb, the mountain of God. Um, God tells Elijah to take the road to Damascus. God specifically calls this wilderness. Um, the, the passage is 19.15, Then Yahweh said unto him, Go return on your way to the wilderness of Damascus. Go and anoint Hazael, the king over um, Aram. Okay. Revelation. So once again, it's a repeat, but a Revelation 2, Jesus compliments the Ephesians for uh, determining someone who said he was an apostle was in effect not uh, an apostle. The Ephesians also um, were, were com uh, commended by uh, Christ for recognizing not to listen to the one who says it's okay to meet, eat meat suffered. Uh, I'm sorry, uh, sacrifice to idols. Um, Paul taught it was okay to, be sacrificed, just to eat meat sacrificed to idols. And uh, Paul told the Ephesians he was an apostle of Jesus. Okay, Raven, Ravening wolf prophecy, prophecy. Jesus has another prophecy meant to invoke the Benjamite wolf prophecy of Deut Deuteronomy 49.10. Jesus does so by referring to false prophets as ravenous, ravening wolves in sheep's clothing, Matthew 7.15. They claim to speak for God and that they are Christians, but instead they are rav ravening wolves. This term ravening wolves only appears two other places in all of the Bible. It it begins with a prophecy about the tribe of Benjamin in later later days. In Genesis 49:10 from Benjamin's tribe will arise one at the same time that a prince of peace arises from the tribe of Judah. The Benjamin the Benjamite figure is called a rav ravening wolf who kills in the morning and divides and spoils in the evening. Okay? So Paul a Benjamite in Romans 11, 1 and Philip 3, 5 killed Christians in the morning of a career, his career. And in the evening of his career, Paul claimed that the 12 apostles divided up Gentiles and Jews so Paul would al alone go to the Gentiles and the, and the 12 to the Jews. That's Galatians 2, 9. So that's Paul's view. However, it's contrary to the Holy Spirit's direction in Acts 10 um, on Cornelius to Peter and then Acts 15 when Peter affirmed Holy Spirit chose Peter to go long ago to be apostles to the Gentiles but it shows Paul's intentions. The only other time ravening wolves is used in all the Bible other than Jesus one time in Matthew 7 feet, 15 and Genesis 49 10 is in Ezekiel. Ezekiel ravening wolves is used to describe religious leaders that draw believers away from following the law including keeping the Sabbath. So Ezekiel 22 26 through 32 because immediately afterwards Paul raced to Jerusalem this is in Ezekiel uh, it's in Ezekiel uh, 22 26 through 32 this is a separate statement because immediately afterwards after he saw um, his sighting in, in Damascus Paul raced to Jerusalem to tell the 12 of the event but Paul's Jesus from the wilderness outside Damascus intervened he told Paul at the temple within feet of the Apostles um, where they were worshiping Get quickly out of Jerusalem, for they will not receive the testimony concerning me. That's Acts 22, 18. Why couldn't Paul's Jesus just appear to the twelve and calm all the doubts which Paul's Jesus said the twelve would have that Paul met the true Christ outside Damascus? Moreover, what harm would, 
would the true Jesus be un- what what harm would the true Jesus be able unable to cope with had Paul spoken to the twelve? How could the true Jesus fear Paul checking in with the apostles about about the validity of his appearance? The true Jesus would have no risk. So, was Paul deceived by someone in the wilderness saying, "I am Jesus"? coming in Christ's name, implying he was the Messiah Jesus. Does Paul's experience fit Jesus' warning that we should not believe those coming in the wilderness privately in my name, saying, I am Christ, after he ascended? Uh, Jesus explained that when he returns and appears next from heaven and earth, it will be visible from every point. I'm, I'm stressing this over and over and over. And you won't be fooled by anyone else. Okay. So, the word appeared... But Paul, and the reason I'm bringing this in is because I've had pastors slash learned people say that uh, Paul's different than the, the, the people the, before the ascension when the apostles saw him. But no, Paul claimed to, I'll read it. Paul's experience with several companions in the wilderness road to Damascus was that Paul says Jesus appeared to Paul just as Jesus appeared to the twelve. First Corinthians, Corinthians 9, 1 um, nine one, one. Uh, oh, I'm sorry. First Corinthians fifteen four through eleven. Um, in, in the New King James, it's seen. In the NIV, it's appeared. So, the companion's perception, however, was limited. They heard the voice but saw no one. Acts nine seven. Um, however, in another account in Paul's court testimony, they saw the light but did not hear the voice which some translates and did not understand the voice, Acts 22, 9. Um, so others with Paul shared the experience in both hearing and sight, although apparently not seeing a person and not understanding the voice. So Paul's experience was not solely a mental one, but he said an appearance of Jesus in Paul's physical presence. Okay, Same, same word if you go back to the original. Um, isn't this physical appearance to Paul after Christ's ascension then one of one saying he was was the Christ fit the warning of the imposter held in the private place or wilderness that every eye on earth does not see uh, after Jesus already ascended to heaven? Doesn't make sense. Okay. Um, we're, we're not going to keep going on this, okay? Um, Paul lacked love for the apostles. And this is talked about in John. One of the One of the things that you will know about a false apostle is he lacks love. All right, Paul, Paul boasted in Galatians 2.6 that the 12 taught him nothing over the last 17 years since the Damascus Road experience. Paul boasted in the period that he had very little interchange with the apostles, mentioning there was only one brief visit with Peter and James in a two-week period, three years after the event outside of Damascus. <clears throat> what? So let's go back to what did John say about Paul? Why did John say that Jesus said his body, his human nature is of no benefit? John 6, 63. It's the spirit, the quickness, the flesh that profits nothing. The words I speak to you, they are spirit, they are life. So his flesh, his body, his human nature, these are Christ. This is what Christ wants you to, to um, base everything on. His flesh, his human nature is of no benefit. doesn't matter if he was born in a human, as a human baby or the event took place. The things about his flesh are irrelevant. Okay, This is the opposite of what Paul taught. This is the opposite of what Christianity teaches us today. Um, the words that I speak to you, they are spirit, they are life. John is making it clear that the, that the message of Christ is paramount, not the man. Um, his humanity, what happened in his flesh, his body, uh, even his human nature, profits not, was of no benefit where and how he was born, where he died, so on and so forth, okay? Um, so, you know, Paul focuses on those things. Original sin. <clears throat> and I've, once again, I've gone over all this in other places, but I needed to, to jump on it here. Original sin. God hath made man upright, Ecclesiastes 7.29. Um, doesn't require commentary, it's clear. God said, let us make man in our own image, after our own likeness. God saw everything had been made, and it was good, Genesis 1, 26, 31. He didn't say it was always a sinful, shameful, whatever. Didn't say it. Very good. What more could be said? Men which is which are made after the similitude of God, James 3, 9. Uh, so men are made just like God. So to teach that man is originally sinful is to teach that God is. Let no one say 
When he is tempted, I am being tempted by God, for God cannot be tempted by evil, and he himself does not tempt anyone. But each one is tempted when he is carried away and enticed by his own lust. Then when lust is conceived, it gives birth to sin, and when sin is accomplished, it brings forth death. That's James 1, 3 through 15. It clearly shows that our own actions do or do not make us sinful slash give birth to sin. Um, so it is we alone that uh, cause ourselves to miss the mark. So, um, <clears throat> and finally, John 1, 9. This was the true light which lighteth every man that come into the world. So Christ uh, enlightens, illuminates, makes us to see each and every member of humanity that comes into the world. So it can't be any clearer. It's diametrically opposite of the original sin and uh, proves it's a, it's a false creation of, of a controlling religious system which Paul is uh, leading up. Um, this, is, this is what Christ said when he said, the kingdom of heaven is within you. Luke 17, 21. When I go deep into this stuff, well, that's part of the gospel message. I go deep into that in the third, third video of the core principles type of documents, the basic stuff. <clears throat> okay, I'm, this once again, I'm covering from, from the uh, other videos, but it's important because it tells us that, uh, I'll read it to you, First John 1, 1 through 4. The truth we bring to you was the original, which we have heard with our own ears, seen with our own, eye, our own eyes, for we actually physically touched and embraced the word of life. For he appeared to us physically, and we are testifying firsthand experience of what was shown and taught to us, that which we ourselves have seen, heard, and handled. We report to you that you might share in the reality of this revelation, that your joy might be full and abundant. Okay? So... The original truth is the only truth, okay? Anyone teaching anything other than what the, the, the folks that walked with Christ and physically touched and embraced him um, is a false doctrine, okay? Which we have heard with our own ears and seen with our own eyes. We actually physically touched and embraced. He physically appeared to us. We are testing, testifying firsthand experience of what is taught to us. So John's aggressively staking out the truth that the original teachings were gleaned only by firsthand experience, walking, talking, living with Christ. Uh, so the reason John is so, uh, so emphatic about this is there was one out there who had not seen, heard, or handled what the original apostles, and he was trying to um, give a different message. Okay, So... He's drawing contrast between the apostles' teachings and the emerging opponent. Okay, First um, John one five through six. This then is the message we heard directly from him, and declaring directly to you, God is light, and in him is not even a shadow of darkness. Any that say they have fellowship with God and yet walk in the ways of darkness are liars, and the truth is not in them. And we. We that walk in light have fellowship with one another. Okay, so he's saying that um, he's, just, he's just beaten this subject into the ground, okay? He's saying that the message that they received, the apostles that walked and talked with Christ, is the light. Anything other than that message, meaning added to, taken away from, which Paul does, um, is... They're liars. They're walking in darkness and they're liars. Okay? And this is not like, okay, well, we have a difference of opinion. There, there's, this is not a, there's not opinion here. These are, like, he's beating it into our heads. Okay? So, um, and he's trying to tell us that these are life and death, spiritual life and death type of things. Okay? We walk in his teachings. And this we know, we follow him, that we walk in his teachings, that no one claims to know him and does not walk in his teachings. He is a liar, and the truth is not in him. But whoever keeps these teachings finds the fullness of them being perfected in him, feels the embrace of the divine. Once again, John, 1 John 2, 3, and 4. Um, you know if the message is true because it would have been someone who walked in his teachings. Okay, The original ways... Uh, following of Christ himself. Anything else 
it's just not um, good. It's it's not gonna it's not gonna happen for you. Okay. Okay. So the one that claims to know Christ and yet does not walk in the original teachings or walks in other teachings is called uh, by John a liar, and warned that their way is not one of truth. This is the gospel about Jesus. Once again, not the message, but the man. Okay. And that's that's where we're all getting pulled sideways on this. Okay. Okay, and then, and then we're going. Then he then he talks about no new teachings. Okay, I'm telling you, he's beating it into our heads, brethren. There are no new teachings to be received aside from those he showed us in the beginning. Um, dear ones, our sons and daughters in the truth. Jesus told us Antichrist would come, and they have. First John two seven. So there's no new teachings, um, and. Christ told us Antichrist would come, and they they have now. Meaning that when John is writing his material, um, there's an opposite message right then and there. This isn't for end times. This is when John wrote his message. Okay, he's writing a letter. Uh, he's not not writing something for two thousand years down the road. Okay, it's right there. The uh, the Antichrist is right there. Antichrist once again means against the teachings of Christ, okay? Here's another kick. He went out from us, but was never part of us. First John 2, 19. He went out from us, but was never a part of us. If he had been of us, he would have remained true to our teachings, but he has not, and is now plain to all see that he never was one of us. Now, we've translated this down. Remember I tell you to go to go to uh, like a Bible hub, get the verse, go to interlinear and get the, go to the, grind it down to the original Greek and or Hebrew, depending on all the New Testament. Um, that's where this comes from. It actually says they in New King's Version, they went out from us. It doesn't matter. It, John is writing in his time, okay? They went out from us, but were never a part of us. So there's kind of two meanings here. The Antichrist did, or Paul did at one time come and speak with the original apostles. They sent him out with a mission, and, and in fact, his conduct showed that he was not part of them. Um, and, you know, there's been plenty of details on that, okay? If he had been one of us, he would have remained true to our teachings, but he hasn't. Right here, kicking your nose. He, he is telling you that what Paul is teaching is not the same as what Christ taught. Go find any of Paul's teachings in, what, in, the, in the Gospels. I mean, I've, done, I've, I've looked. It's not there, okay? So... Of God, follow the original teachings. This is how we know we are God's true offspring. We follow his original teachings. 1 John 5, 2. So once again, original teachings, no additions. Um, we know this, this is 1 John 5, 20 through 21. We know the Son of the Divine came, for he himself gave us this understanding face to face. Therefore, beloved children, guard yourself. So he's telling us, look, we have the, we're giving the true teachings. We walked with Christ. Anything else, guard yourself from it. Okay. Um, another topic. Second John, one one through three. John approves of women in the church. I re, he's writing this to. Well, you'll hear it. I rejoice greatly in writing to you, my elect lady, as the elder and leader of a congregation wherein I find you and your spiritual children walking in true teachings of the Father. Once again, John, 2 John 1, 1 through 3. So John makes certain we, that we understand he's addressing um, this letter to a woman. He wants us to notice that um, an apostle of the Lord, he calls her elect or called out. He wants to be sure we know that she is a pastor of a local congregation. He approves of a woman leading the church. And this practice is consistent with the true teachings of the Father. John approved of women in leadership and ministry. Um, no group that opposes the full equality of women in participation in leadership can claim to be in line with the original teachings of Christ. Therefore, any group that ignores or explains away the plain language of discrimination cannot and should not be trusted. <clears throat> For there are no new teachings, only the original ones. And in John, Second John. One, five, and we um, and the love we and the love we are to have for one another, um, of course, 
love is walking with the teachings we have had from the beginning. Okay, so there's no new teachings, only original one, and um, love is walking with the teachings, the original teachings. Okay, no one sneaks in. Okay, this is the door <clears throat> that Jesus talks about. That no one does not enter through the door when he, that one, the one that does not enter through the door when he comes, but sneaks in some other way, that man is a thief and a robber. So these are the words of Christ. He warns us that, that one is coming that will come in through, will not come in through the door. The door is Christ and his apostles and the message, you know, Christ foretells someone will try and sneak in some other way. He will not have been one of the twelve and will not follow their teachings. Christ calls this man a thief and a liar. The one who comes through the door, once again the door is Christ, is the true shepherd. His voice the sheep hear and his voice the sheep follow. Let the sheep free, flee from the voice of the stranger. Verses 3 and 4. So he encourages his believers to run away from the teachings of any stranger or any apostle that's not teaching their message. Okay, so Paul said he was the first to say Jesus saved us from our sins. So, if, and I'm not going to read the whole thing. You see it's a mile long here. It's 1 Corinthians 15, chapter 15. For I delivered unto you first all of that which I received, now that Christ Jesus died for our sins according to the scriptures, and that he was buried, then he rose again according to the scriptures. First of all, none of this uh, is, in the, is in the Old Testament. And uh, that he was seen of Cephas, then of the twelve. After that, he was seen by about 500. Okay, I'm not going to read the rest. So these are the words of Paul. For I delivered unto you first, who delivered this message first. Who delivered the message first? Paul did. <clears throat> um, of all that which have, I have also received. How did he get this message? He claims he received it spiritually. Paul asks us to believe, actually requires us to believe that he received a message the original apostles of Christ did not even though they were alive and well within a few miles of him. So Paul was the first to preach of the resurrection. For I delivered to you unto that first, that he died for our sins, okay? So uh, the words of Paul, I delivered unto you first. Who delivered the message? Paul did. How did he get this message? He claims to have received it spiritually. Uh, Paul um, claims he got the message that John says the apostles didn't know. So you're free to choose whoever you want. You can believe Paul, you can believe John, you can, you can simply not believe the truth. Um, that, uh, that's, that's the key, okay? So let's put it all together so we know what we're dealing with here. For I delivered unto you first the message I received, how Christ died for our sins according to the scripture, was buried, rose again the third day and according to the scriptures. Paul makes it clear that he is talking about a message he first received and preached, his own personal message he received independent of the of the apostles. This is his own gospel. Okay, um, it's it's now clear that this gospel was never taught by anyone before Paul. Okay, remember, John said that in John twenty nine that they had never been taught about the resurrection. It wasn't part of what they were taught, um, and then. Uh, according to the scriptures, what scriptures? Okay, um, you know, basically, unless he's talking about things he's pulling from other religions uh, of the day, uh, it's not. It's not in the scriptures. Okay, so Paul is elevating his own writings above those of the apostles and proclaiming them to be scripture. So Paul contradicts the Old Testament in many ways. Here's one: um, what must happen in order for the Messiah to come? A very specific trigger. The Jews must repent. The Jews must turn back to God in mass. Isaiah 59, 20. And a redeemer will come to Zion. In those days, in, in though, to those in Jacob who turn from transgressions, declares the Lord. To those who turn from transgressions. Paul changes this, and Paul teaches that no one can repent. So in, in, um, in Isaiah 59, 20, God's saying that he's going to come to those that have Turned, uh, turned from transgression or turned to God. Paul teaches that no one can repent in Romans eleven twenty six. Um, he uh, 
Um, so he adds this, and, and in this way, all Israel will be saved as it is written. First of all, this is, once again, not how it's written. Deliverer will come from Zion. He will be banished ungodly. He will banish the ungodliness from Jacob. First, if you read the, read the other one, it said that they will turn back from God. He, he's not going to unbanish them, anything. And this will be my covenant with them when I take away their sins. Uh, not said. Okay, it's the uh, prophecy. He's going to come to those who turn from trend. They're they're doing it themselves. Okay, no one's doing it for them. Okay, so now. Paul has not only appointed himself an apostle, but now a writer of scripture. And I'm going to, I'm going to write on uh, the new covenant. Paul twists that around as well. Okay, um, so, uh, so then you know if you're going to lie, you might as well lie big. Okay, so here's another big whopper. Okay, so as seen of Cephas, which is Peter, then of the twelve. So Cephas, Peter. Peter was one of the twelve. As such, one of those that John said, for as yet they knew not. Okay, so John, once again, said this earlier, John 29. For as yet they knew not the scripture that he must rise again from the dead. So um, Paul um, con conveniently neglects to mention that Peter, after hearing the report from Mary Magdalene and the mother of James, still believed not. That was in Mark 16, 11. Paul also neglects to mention that even after being seen by Cephas, um, then 11 disciples went away from Galilee into the mountain where they had appointed them and where they worshiped with some doubted. That was Matthew 28, 16 through 17. So <clears throat> even after seeing Paul's, uh, the, the whatever, Paul, Peter, the, so Peter didn't believe. Uh, if Peter, the unquestioned leader, had believed, they would all have gone along. So if you're going to be, you know, so here's here's the lie. So here's where Paul tells them plain, or part of the lie, okay? Um, then of the 12, so Paul messed up. At the time, this event, there was no 12 to see. At the time, there were only 11 disciples, not 12. Judas is already dead, and Paul is once again caught in, you know, a lie. So... Um, so was this Paul making a critical liar's mistake, or, as some would think, was it Luke, um, who was Paul's personal scribe, uh, by this time was, was he a double agent for the true apostles, meaning was he uh, putting things in Paul's writing so that we could see the, the air uh, to the way, okay? Okay, so... Um, remember that uh, Jesus taught us that appearances can be deceiving. Stop judging by mere appearance, but instead judge correctly. John seven twenty four, Proverbs fourteen two similar teaches there is a way that appears to be right, but in the end it leads to death. Um, thus, are we on a path to death by trying to follow Paul's words, besides those of Christ delivered pre ascension, and once again the nature of Christ's return. We went over this. Every eye will see. Um, and then the next, this is a little bit of, again on the prophecy of prophecy contain, uh, concerning Peter. We went over that. Um, okay, now the twelve apostles rejected Paul. Okay, um, this is going to probably go a little bit deeper than most will care, um, but we're going to do it. We're going to do it. As, I'm going to do it as quick as possible. However, the 12 apostles did catch on. The fact that Paul's Jesus of the Masses tried to delay taking place as long as possible. The earliest church traces to the 12 apostles knowing the, the Ebion, the poor. Um, did, 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 so the early 12 apostles were known as Ebion, the poor. And did they exclude Paul from the canon? Uh, it's a well-known fact that, that they are, they, they said Paul's false. Okay, the Ebionites, the poor. Remember, if you go back to watch my other videos, Jerusalem was totally ground in the ground. It said plowed to dirt, plowed to dust. Everything was destroyed. They destroyed the uh, teachings of the Ebionites, the poor, the ones who probably the ones who were followed Christ's teachings. However, luckily we're, not luckily, according to God's will, we did find um, in, the, in the caves of Qumran some of these writings. Okay, and we're going to find more because 
John said there's more writings out there. Okay, but I'm going I'm to really buzz through this because we've gone through a lot. We're almost at an hour. Um, I'm getting tuckered out. Okay. So, 12 proofs. After the Jesus of Damascus, uh, Damascus visited Paul, Damascus rushed to Jerusalem to see the 12 apostles, tell them what had happened. However, he was, he was um, stopped and he was told not to read for, meet, meet for that reason. So Acts 22, 14 through 22. Okay. Um, you know, why couldn't the Jesus of Damascus not simply have appeared to all? Okay, that's one. Number two, then three years later, Paul went to Jerusalem and spent a brief time with Peter over two weeks. There, Paul also met James, the brother of Jesus, but no other apostles. That's Galatians 1.18, Galatians 1.19. Paul speaks about a point up through 14 years where he can still brag at all his encounters that the apostles imparted nothing to me. Galatians 2.6. In context, um, let's see. Okay. He's, we're, we're to believe that only believe what Paul said because the apostles added nothing. Then in Acts, this is the third one, Acts 9, 26 through 31. So uh, after 14 years in the, the three-year visit, according to Galatians 2, 1, with Barnabas was with him, 2, 6, Paul, er, in three years, so, um, and after the visit, Paul is brought to Jerusalem by Barnabas and introduced to the 12. But the 12 apostles still had the same disbelief belief and lack of trust in Paul. And, and here's the, the verse. And Saul, having come to Jerusalem, did try to join himself to the disciples, and they were all afraid of him, not believing he is a disciple. Okay, four. Luke records a no positive apostolic response in Acts 9, 26 through 31. Okay, the one we just talked about. Um, all Luke records is their distrust. Okay, we talked a little bit about maybe Luke is, is kind of trying to lay some hints here for us. Okay, um, so but Luke says um, nothing about the twelve accepting Paul, let alone as a thirteenth apostle. Um, Luke provides an entirely mute response from the twelve others that rejected Paul, cited in verses twenty six to thirty one. All right, number five. Luke's negative only response from the twelve is consistent with Paul's record of the first meeting of all 12 in Damascus from Galatians 2.6. Paul recounts that after the meeting with the apostles and the leaders of Jerusalem church, that apostles still imparting nothing to me and the esteem others in them meant no difference to me. Okay. Um, number six, this distrust of Paul by the apostles continued. First James, the bishop of Jerusalem and the brother of Jesus, Galatians 1.9, and whom Paul identifies as an apostle, Galatians 1.19, confronts Paul in Acts 21.21 about charges that Paul of guilty of apostasia, or Greek for apostasy, from the law God gave Moses. Second, Paul complained the apostles refused to give him letters of commendation that Gentiles would accept, so the Gentiles would accept Paul's teachings as authorized, thanking his listeners for accepting him without such letters based on signs and wonders, um, so the signs of an apostle. Okay, so Paul didn't get any, they didn't give him any backing. Next, um, let's see here. Okay, apostasy is a charge that one is violating Deuteronomy 13, 1 through 10, where one with true prophecy and signs and wonders is a false prophet solely because one tries to, to seduce and turn away others from the law given you here today. The Ten Commandments apparently co concurrent with uh, Mosaic commands. Um, so, um, apostasy. Long story short, anyone who teaches not to follow the law is, is an ap apostate. Um, okay, so in Acts 21 21, James, who is known as James the Just, who is one of the apostles in Paul's mind, asked Paul to reassure everyone that Paul is not guilty of apostasy by performing vow and ritual that come from number six, part of the Mosaic law. Paul complies and says nothing to dissuade James' confidence that Paul is not apostate of law. Paul is hanging kind of on a thin line here. We must wonder um, about what would happen when the apostles of Jerusalem find out Paul's true views were such as in Romans 7, 1 through 7. Okay, 
Next, the Ebonites exclude Paul's writings as written by an apostate. Um, so the Ebonites, uh, the, the Jerusalem church under the 12, um, which um, is proven in verse 10 through 12 below, um, declared Paul's writings are excluded from being read by believers because Paul is guilty of apostasy. Okay, um, Arrhenius, who was like early hundreds, uh, wrote that the Ebonites from the early stage used the Gospel of Matthew only and repudiate Paul, maintaining that he was an apostate from the law. Um, uh, Eubusus likewise said the Ebonites thought it was necessary to reject all the epistles of the Apostle Paul, whom they called apostate from law. Okay, we're getting there. All right, so I wanted to be complete. I know it gets long. I'm sure, but we, we need to grind through. How do we know the Ebionites were the Jerusalem church under the 12? There's many proofs. First, look at how tight the connection is, is between Acts 21 21, where James tells Paul that he heard Paul was an apostate. And then after Paul, Paul deflects James' concern by performing a Mosaic law vow, the Ebionites find Paul as an apostate against the Mosaic law, given Paul's epistles could not be hid for long. James and the apostles who followed Deuteronomy 13, 1 through 10, would have in reasonable time after Acts 21 have found out about Romans 7, 1 through 7. The passage, beyond all doubt, clearly makes Paul an apostate under Deuteronomy 13, 1 through 10. Second, Ebonite was a de designation at first, a common name for all Christians as uh, Ep Epineus uh, testifies or writes about. Um, uh, the name meant the poor in Hebrew, from Ebion, meaning the poor. Thus, because the name Ebion was used earliest to refer to the believers before the term Christians was first used in Antioch, it's logical to infer that the earliest name of the church, uh, that was the earliest name of the church on the apostles. All right, so proof for this uh, is even in the pages of the New Testament, right? Paul writes in Galatians 2.10 that the apostles asked Paul to remember the poor at Jerusalem. So we can deduce that Paul meant the poor, capital P, representing Ebion of, of Jerusalem, for it's unlikely that the apostles singled out helping, you know, monetarily only the poor of Jerusalem, or the poor were everywhere. <clears throat> so more proof um, that the Ebionites were an apostolic, were the apostles' church found in the Dead Sea Scrolls, where scholars found a remnant a writing of the community known as Ebion, um, whose leader, the Zadok, the just one in Hebrew, was battling the sprouter of lies over whether works were necessary for righteousness besides faith. They were arguing over Habakkuk 2.4, Paul's frequent proof text for faith alone. James, a bishop of Jerusalem, was uh, in, uh, in fact known as James the Just. This fits the label Zedek, a Hebrew word meaning just one. So Dead Sea Scrolls are showing Paul and James going back and forth. The debate... Um, with Paul, um, who is often says, you know, he has to deflect charges that he's lying. There's like a dozen verses. I'm not lying. I'm not lying. I'm not lying. Okay. Um, I've got those if you want them. Um, uh, and uh, over the text, Paul misused twice Habakkuk 2.4. Um, so it doesn't take a big stretch to deduce the Ebonites were the church of James and the Twelve depicted in Acts 15. Okay. Um, I'm going to skip some things here. Okay. Okay. Um, so, other uh, so James refutes that uh, that faith alone when he writes in James two fourteen. Through 24, you say that a man is justified by his works, not by faith alone. And uh, um, James obviously believes Paul is adding erroneous tenet to the gospel. Okay. Augustine likewise stated that uh, Apostle Peter, known as the second, uh, confirmed James' critiques. And Peter added the critique of Paul, hard to understand, um, because, and ignorant and unstable. Um, that, you know, led to lawlessness, okay? So Augustine said this carelessness was due to faith alone from reading Paul's verses that support such a view. 
Okay. Faith alone, by the way, is 1 Corinthians 6, 9 through 10, Galatians 5, 19 through 21. All right. So, Peter, James, John, and Jude direct their aim chiefly against that, the faith alone things. So to maintain with view the faith without works profits not. Okay. Um, all right. So, um, Jude 4 and 11, we read an obvious indictment. Uh, about Paul following a different Jesus. Okay, This is in Jude 4. For admission has been secretly gained by some who long ago were designated for this condemnation, ungodly, uh, ungodly person who pervert the grace of our God into litigiousness and deny only our only Master and Lord Jesus Christ. Woe to them, for they walk in the way of Cain and abandon themselves for the sake of gain of Balaam's error and perish in Corin's rebellion. So that's in Jude. Okay. So why is this about Paul? So the person or persons secretly gained admission among Christians and perverted grace um, and, and, and was talking about lawlessness. Um, so merited grace. Charis, C-H-R-I-S, you was used four times by Christ. Um, and Jesus... Four times grace is earned by exceptional good behavior beyond what sinners do. So grace does not necessarily save you in Jesus' view. It means that God's favor grace is upon you. Incidentally, translators never once render charis as anything but credit or thanks um, in these passages. Next, Jude compares the false teacher and his followers to Cain, who resented the grace favor that the superior offering by Abel earned in God's eyes. Paul taught that earning grace this way necessarily leads to human boasting, Ephesians 2, 8, 9, rather than God's pleasure. Grace had <clears throat> to be supposedly unmerited to avoid human boasting. However, this too disowns the authority of the true uh, Jesus, uh, who speaks contrarily and also directly contradicts, and also contradicts Genesis 4, 1 through 9. Um, Balaam's error. Next, Jude said this person is a follower and teacher of Balaam's error. What is that? It was eating meat sacrificed to idols, Revelation 2.14, something Paul endorsed multiple times, unless you're around the weak brother who thinks it's wrong. You're afraid only if, if a weak mind brother might see you exercising the right to eat meat sacrificed to idols and violates this weak conscious. Corinthians, 1 Corinthians 10, 28-29, 1 Corinthians 8, 4-12. Korah's Rebellion. Finally, Jude compares this teacher and followers with Korah's Rebellion. What's that? Korah's rebellion was against Moses ruling over the people. See Numbers 16, 1 through 11. So Paul's overthrow of Moses' rule over Israel in Romans 7, 1 through 7. Paul's exclusion of law um, applying to the Gentiles, um, as, you know, as well as many other places. So Jude um, is stating that because it's Korah's error, Korah's error because Paul's saying you don't have to follow the law anymore. Okay. Um, so in addition around you know when when John wrote Revelation which Jesus spoke in clear language in Revelation 2 that Jesus condemned a false apostle who told the Ephesians um, he was one of the apostles or not we went over that a couple of times okay so this fits um, Matthias replaced Judas in Acts 1 there's no 13th apostle okay there was no room for a 13th possible as Jesus said two times, there would only be 12 into eternity. This was repeated by Jesus after Paul's death, Revelation 21. The, um, okay, so Revelation of Jesus is uh, opposed to Paul. Um, in the same passage, Revelation 2.14 condemned likewise the person teaching that it is okay to eat meat sacrificed to idols. So Paul clearly did this, only restricting doing so when around others, da 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 um, Jesus in Revelation 2, 1 through 4, condemned twice Paul's authority and teaching in just 14 verses. So, um, you know, these words can't be ignored. Okay, Revelation 2, 20, Jesus quotes Paul's words uh, in Corinthians, 1 Corinthians 2, 10, as is in disapproving fashion, is what false uh, prophets Isabel relies upon to teach and eat meat sacrificed to idols. Okay. Um, so this is Christ in 
revelation. Okay. Um, almost done here. I'm just looking to get through some stuff here. Um, all right. And, and lastly, we're just going to go to Paul did not receive apostolic letters of recommendation based upon 2 Corinthians 10, 9 through 18. Um, uh, uh, and also two, and First Corinthians nine through one nine one through two, and uh, read together with Second Corinthians eleven thirteen through fifteen, Second Corinthians three one. So Paul implies himself implies that twelve rejected supporting his authority in the church. Okay, um, let's see this. So this conflict boiled over Paul's, into Paul's writings, and uh, he said he didn't need anyone else's recommendation um, for his endurance and great work um, through glory and dishonor and bad report and good report, genuine yet regarded as impostors. So 2 Corinthians 6, 3 through 6. Um, so basically the, the 12 refused Paul. Okay. Um, and then lastly, before we wound this up, and I got long, it got deep, it got probably boring for some, most. Finally, the Ebonites in the early 200s preserved their opinions about Paul by writing the Clementine homilies and, and recognitions of Clement. These works contend Peter realized that Paul apparently, uh, rev and, and revised uh, Simon Magnus rather than Paul, followed a different Christ and was the enemy who who teaches against the law and invites Christians to eat meat, sacrifice to idols as long as not eaten in front of a Christian who looks around. Okay. All right, so the question is, so are we judging correctly um, on, on Paul's words? Remember, Jesus taught us appearances can be deceiving. Stop judging by appearances. Instead, judge by judge correctly. John 7, 24, Proverbs 14, 2. And there's a, a, a way that appears to be right, but in the end, it, it, it leads to death. So choice is yours threw a whole bunch of stuff at you. Um, um, you've got to make a choice. Are you going to follow Paul's teachings, which are totally different than Christ? Um, and see that in my other, my other videos. Have a great day. Hope this was helpful. Thank you much.